All right. Okay, week one Friday, we're going to discuss more ggplot stuff. Just a few reminders. Daily symptom monitoring. You guys got to do this every day. Um, I check the status of who's done it, and not everybody does it. So please do it. If you forgot to do it this morning, just go ahead and do it right now. Okay, um, the data camp homework. I don't know how this mic thing works. Okay, data camp homework is due tonight. So uh, make sure you finish that. I think most of you, probably everyone in this room have done, has done it, but there's a, there's a handful of students and I don't know how I'm gonna communicate to those handful of students that I suspect might also be the ones that aren't present, physically present, but maybe watching this video, but maybe by the time they watch the video, it's too late, I don't know. Okay, well anyway, when I assign the data camp homework, you know, just make sure you get it done. Okay, I posted homework one up on uh, CCLE. Okay, where is it? Uh, right here, okay. So uh, the way it works, You'll download the files here, and uh, and this is how you'll do the uh, the homework. And then, when you finish, you'll submit it to GradeScope. Okay, and I think uh, oh, you know what? I shouldn't <laughs> I shouldn't click GradeScope while I'm the teacher logged in here. But um, uh, that's uh, that's how that's gonna go. Okay, uh, let me just talk a tiny bit about the. All right, I hope I'm, <laughs> I hope I'm recording here. Okay, um, so when you, what I highly recommend, okay, is somewhere on your computer, so in this example, I'm gonna create a folder on my desktop, okay? But create a, create a folder for each homework assignment. So this is homework one, so create a whole folder called homework one, okay? Uh, next homework, create a folder called homework two, okay? And inside, inside that folder, I want you to download these files, okay? So you're going to click Save, Link, and you'll navigate to your desktop. You go to your Homework 1 folder. We're going to save Example 1 there. Save the uh, PDF instructions there. Save the RMD file there. Okay, so now I've got all three of my uh, files here. Okay, and then um, you know you can read the instructions, and uh, and this homework, uh, I think, I think it's pretty easy. But then again, that's that's me, right? And it, so I don't know, you know, like what I think is easy might not be easy for you. But it, but I think it was my intention. I'll say that. Okay, it was my intention to make something. Fairly easy, fairly straightforward, okay? They'll, they'll get a little bit more complicated uh, as the course goes on, okay? And then so, so I've opened up the PDF. Here are the instructions, and I've opened up the RMD file. That opens up in our studio, okay? And basically, if you've installed, let me uh, magnify things a little bit. If you've installed R, you've installed R Studio, you've installed Tiny Tech, then you should be able, as soon as you open this, I want you to try this. Before you do anything else, and this is, this is also what's written in the instructions, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to just click this button, Knit. Okay, before you try anything else, just click the button, Knit, and, uh, and we hope that it knits, okay? So uh, you're going to see a bunch of stuff fly by on our markdown. And what we want is we want a little window to pop up. OK, on command. And, and this is the, the file that has been knit. OK? So, so that's what we want. OK? And if, and if you see this, then great. OK? And then what you're going to need to do, OK? So here it says your name here and your name here. Okay, what you need to do is you need to, you know, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try putting in your name, all right? So I'm going to put in Miles Chen here. This is, 
kind of an academic integrity statement that basically just says, I did this. I didn't copy somebody else, okay? And then, um, and then so you try that, and then we'll try knitting. Whoops. Uh, that's for the other class. Okay, we'll try uh, knitting again, right? And you know, when you knit, it takes, it takes a moment. So you don't have to knit every single time. I do suggest knitting after each problem, okay? So there's, part, there's five parts, part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, okay? What you wanna do is after you think you've completed a part, try knitting it, okay? And then see if it renders, okay? And if it renders, great. And if it doesn't, okay? So let's say you, you finished part one and it renders, okay? And then you move on to part two and you think you're done with part two, and you click knit and it doesn't render, it doesn't produce an output file, okay? Then you know you've made a mistake somewhere in part two, okay? What happens if you don't do that, if you don't kind of follow that process and you just wait till the end and it just doesn't work, then you gotta kind of trace back everything and, and figure that out, right? So, you know, if something doesn't knit, then uh, try like removing some stuff and then try knitting it. And if it knits, then, then um, then you know that the problem lies in that part that you removed, okay? Uh, if you remove some stuff and it still doesn't knit, try removing more stuff, okay? And basically, <laughs> you just keep removing stuff until it knits, okay? And then you st slowly start adding stuff back in until it fails to knit, and then you can try to identify where things go wrong, okay? Um, an important thing that causes a lot of problems is don't copy and paste text from a PDF or a uh, or even a web page. <laughs> don't copy and paste text from a PDF or a web page into the file because this file expects you to be inputting stuff from a keyboard. Okay, so for example, like when you do the quote marks, they're like straight quotes. Okay, whereas I think, I mean, I, I don't think this will cause a problem, but let's say, let's say on Word, you know, so anytime you have like a word processor or something, this is like, um, so if I say hello, and then I put quotes around it, okay, see how they, they curve, okay, rather than the straight quotes, okay, so in R, you always get the straight quotes, but in in a, in a word processor, it automatically makes these curved things, okay? And, and if you copy this into R, okay, it's, it's hard to see. I don't know if I can, oh geez, okay. Uh, so if I blow it up really big, you can see that there actually is a slight difference between these quote marks and these quote marks, okay? Um, okay, I, I need to go back, it's too big. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, let me see. Uh, I think this will knit fun, okay? I think, I think the computer can handle the, uh, the curved quotes, okay? But sometimes you copy something and it'll have like a little emoji type thing, like some kind of symbol that it doesn't know how to handle, right? So, uh, so let's say let's say uh, you're copying stuff, um, and let's say you know you decide to put in um, a uh, some kind of symbol here, okay? And and this can happen when you're like copying and pasting, and you can end up getting these like weird uh, these symbols here, and this this kind of stuff can end up breaking the uh, the knitting process, okay? Okay, all right, I don't know which. <laughs> so, so everything's, of course, working, and of course the examples I'm trying to show you when it breaks, it's not um, actually breaking. But, um, well, let's see. Okay, so th this is rendering just fine. All right, well, okay. <laughs> but trust me, it happens, okay? I can't, I can't give you a live example right now, but, uh, but sometimes it happens, and it often happens when you copy and paste um, text. Uh, from a PDF or from somewhere online, okay? Um, so anyway, um, hopefully uh, you can you can start working through the, this homework here, okay? And um, 
and that will be that. Okay, all right. Uh, any questions? All right, well, I guess I guess you'll have to. Um, All right, where is today's lecture? Okay. All right, what have here? Oh. All right, let's see. All right, so let's get into the lecture. Okay. All right. Um, so. We, uh, we left off on Wednesday uh, dealing with um, just kind of ggplot. We said here's kind of our, our data set. We've got the height, the weight, the gender, the hair color. And, uh, and then if you kind of create these things, you can do ggplot. You name the data set that you're working with. You, um, you give it aesthetic mappings. Here we're mapping height to the x-axis, weight to the y-axis. And then we're going to say add some points. And you know what? I also want to color the points based on gender. Okay, so so we have kind of three attributes being mapped onto the data uh, onto the image here. Okay, we also said you can also change the settings. Settings are different from mappings in that when you uh, when you apply a setting, it does not communicate anything from the data. It's just going to apply this to everything. So all of the dots will become size 10, all of the dots will become blue. There's nothing about the data being communicated in the setting, right? So the color here doesn't tell us anything about the data. It doesn't tell us what gender or anything like that, okay? And this is kind of where we left off. And, and so now I just want to kind of show you some other options here, okay? So here with P plus G on point, we're not applying a setting. Okay, so when we plot these, it's just going to be little uh, black dots, okay, for each individual. But what I've changed here is I've changed scale x continuous, okay, and I've changed the limits. I said the lower bound I want to be 60, the upper bound I want to be 100, and that's what we see. That's what we see in our, uh, in our graph here, right? We see over on this side, the lower bound is 60. Over on the, uh, the right-hand side, over here, the upper bound is 100, okay? And, and you might say, well, how, do I, how am I supposed to remember this, right? Scale x continuous. Um, so the answer is you use Google, okay? And, uh, and basically, you do stuff like this. You say ggplot. Uh, set axis limits or something like that, right? You just you kind of you just type in what it is that you want to do in ggplot. So you just say ggplot. How do I do this? Okay. And generally, the internet is pretty good at figuring out what it is that <laughs> you're trying to do. And so here we get okay. And and basically, what you want to search for is you want to look for ggplot.tidyverse, ggplot2.tidyverse. That's going to be the official reference documents, okay? That's uh, the producers of ggplot. And again, ggplot's part of the tidyverse. What you want is the official one. Now, there's going to be a bunch of other things. Stack Overflow, usually pretty good, okay? And then there's going to be a whole bunch of other just random people writing their little blog sites saying like, oh, learn data science from me and uh, and you know subscribe to my channel and uh, what, whatever they say right and and all of these things probably now I'm not knocking any of these things some of these are very high quality excellent resources there's also a lot of not great ones okay and and I don't there's so many out there I can't tell you like oh this one's great and this one's bad I mean so I'll tell you the official ones those are good stack overflow because there's like an upvoting and downvoting system, usually the good ones float to the top. Uh, after that, it's it's you just gotta you just gotta guess, okay? Um, and as you gain experience, you go, oh yeah, this is not a good one, right? But in the beginning, 
it's hard to judge, right? Like when you're a kid and somebody tells you stuff, you have no like idea like, is this person, you know, you don't even think like, is this person trustworthy and telling me the truth? You just believe everything you hear. And when you're new to ggplot and new to his stuff, you just kind of go along with everything. And then later on after you realize stuff, you're like, oh, this, this wasn't so great. Okay. So anyway, um, you can see these are different examples, right? Uh, it says see also these things. And then there's a bunch of, in the official reference, there's a bunch of different examples showing you you know, how do you uh, apply these different kind of scales and stuff like that. So, so I don't expect anybody to have all of these things memorized, but, uh, but you will need to use um, the internet to kind of figure these things out, okay? All right, you can also change, change the scale for other things, right? So scale, it sounds like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense for the numbers that we put across the bottom. Okay, but remember what a scale is, it's is um, when we map a data attribute to a visual cue, how we decide to do that is the scale, okay? And so when we say, okay, we're gonna take these numbers and put them on this side, and these numbers, you know, 100 goes over here, and these numbers, 300 goes over here, that's a scale. And you know, we have like a linear scale, right? And you can have a logarithmic scale, and that's gonna change how the numbers get mapped onto a visual position, okay? But just as much as a scale the numbers is, is the scale of saying, okay, when we see this data value, say uh, female, and it needs to turn into a color, how do we, what color do we choose? Okay, and you know the default is, you know, uh, one of them is like red, and the other one's kind of this teal blue color. Okay, but you could say, you know what, the visual attribute that I want to choose, I want orange, and I want green. Okay, or forest green in this case. Okay, so we're gonna say, um, we're gonna add points. Okay, we're gonna map gender to the color. And here we're going to choose the, the, a manual color scale, picking the colors that we want, okay? Does that kind of make sense that this is also a form of a scale, even though it's like, it's, it's not like this, you know, number line. It's, a, it's saying like, hey, this, these values correspond to these visual properties, okay? And, um, and here we go, okay? And when you have a color scale, or when you have values getting, you know, you need to have a legend or a guide that tells you, oh, okay, uh, the orange dots are female, the green dots are male, okay? Um, so you have that, okay? Now the default, default settings is you get this gray background with white grid lines, okay? That's kind of the default, yeah, question. I'm wondering why size and size equals 10 is all set off aesthetics. What, why is size equal to 10? Why is it all set off aesthetics? Oh, okay. So size equals 10 is a setting and it's outside of the aesthetics because you put, you put things into aesthetics if it's going to be a data property and it's going to communicate something, right? So. So if I wanted to communicate, let's say we had um, age as a variable here, okay? And I wanted the size, the age, the size to correspond to the age. Then I could put age, size equals age, inside the aesthetics, okay? And that means younger people would get smaller dots, older people with bigger numbers for age would get larger dots or something like that, okay? But in, in our case, I just want all the dots to be the same size, and so no, nothing about the data is being communicated in the size, so the size is equal to 10. Yeah, question. Yeah, Back there, yeah. I, I was wondering, because I mean, in this example, right, there's kind of two classes for the gender, uh -huh. and there's two polygons, but what if I have like seven different categories here, and I chose two colors and just get the whole manual? Okay, so yeah, it, it, you would run into a problem if you choose scale color manual. Um, you would have to give it seven, uh, there is a way to do a color gradient. Like you said, you can pick one color on the other side, and I got an example of that coming up later, where you can say, you know what, I've got um, 
you know, like seven values or something, and I want to create a color gradient. But the color gradient for seven values only works if those seven values are ordered, if that makes sense, right? So, so if you had something like um, uh, strongly disagree, disagree, only a little bit disagree, and neutral, and a little bit agree, and, and you know, all the way up to strongly agree, where there's an order from one side to the other, you could put a gradient on that, okay? But if it's something like, I'm from California, and I'm from Connecticut, and I'm from Kansas, and I'm from Texas, it doesn't make sense to use a gradient there, right? Because it's not like um, <laughs> dark red means this, and you know, light pink, or I don't know, you know, uh, the gradient there just doesn't make sense, okay? So, so you have to kind of think uh, about about these these aspects, okay? Yes. Um. So, like, what we, what we like cover in a static means is negative variable. Well, outside it, it's just a setting. Like, yes. Yes. Oh. If it's inside the AES, the aesthetic thing, looking this function, it says uh, an attribute of the data is being linked to this visual property, this aesthetic attribute. Okay. Whereas when it's outside of that, it's just this is going to apply to every single data value. Okay. Every single point is going to get this thing. You know, I like big dots. So I want size equal to 10, OK? And, uh, and, and that's fine, right? But again, yeah, if you have another variable where you can say, you know what, I want to link the size to the, the thing, you can do that, OK? Um, this, is, uh, this is called a, uh, the black and white theme. There's a bunch of different themes, OK? The black and white themes gets rid of the gray background and, and white grid lines, uses a white background with gray grid lines, okay? This is great if you have to like print out your report, okay? Because, you know, you're gonna end up spending like $20 on ink getting, you know, the gray on your little, you know, your inkjet printer or whatever. Um, I don't know if you guys bought a printer, but I think in the long run, even if you print like a bunch of pages, it's just cheaper to use the university printers and, and stuff, you know? It feels like, oh, I gotta pay every single paper I print, right? But how many, honestly, how many pages are you gonna end up printing out during your career here? Probably not that, that, that many, okay? And so, you know, it is convenient having a printer in your own room, but, but then it's like, that, that ink is so expensive. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, okay. Um, what was I saying? I got distracted. Okay. Um, all right. So yes, the reference, you know, go here, go on the internet, say ggplot, how do I do this? And then try to look for the official reference as one of the answers. Or, or Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange. Usually those are pretty, uh, pretty good resources. Okay. Let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer for today. First view quiz answer today is the letter B. B as in bear. B as in bear is your first view quiz answer. Okay. Um, one one thing to note is that when you do uh, when you create things in ggplot, uh, it creates an object, and by default, when you create an object. Or when when you just kind of name the object in R, it's going to kind of output it, okay? And that that image that gets produced, that plot that gets produced, is the output of the ggplot object. Now, we haven't really talked about loops or scripts or functions or things like that yet. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that just as it pertains to uh, what we're doing. And again, this is not an R programming course. We're certainly using a lot of R. But it's the, the focus is not the R programming. Um, and so if you ever run a function and you want the function to produce a plot, you have to call the function print. And you'll say, print out this plot, right? So you, you create a plot in ggplot. And then you say, print out the plot, OK? When, you, when we work with ggplot interactively, it just default prints everything out as we're working. But you know, um, 
in later examples, I just realized I've got like this an image of myself right here. And this, yeah. It's tripping me out. OK. Uh, uh, we, we get this, um, you know, you, you got to call print from inside a function if you want your plots to appear. OK. Uh, don't don't worry about it too much, but that's I, I got to throw that in there to, to just kind of make sure. Okay, there's also um, and and the book does a better job talking about this. Okay, we have these kind of canonical graphs or these stats things, and so there are just kind of some plots that we uh, are accustomed to seeing, like histograms and stuff like that. And you can actually think about what is a histogram displaying. It's actually, there's a process in making a histogram. You can't just take a data set and say, make a histogram right, off, right away like that, right? What you have to do, like if I gave you a table of data and I said, make a histogram, it requires you to do some work, right? You've got to take that histogram, uh, take that table of data, you've got to figure out some bins, you've got to figure out bin width, and you've got to go through and you've got to count how many values fit into each bin. And then you say, okay, now I need to make bars of this height corresponding to each bin. And that's how you get your histogram, okay? Now, it's such a common plot that, you know, we often forget that there's that process that's involved. Um, and, you know, ggplot knows that people want to create histograms. So there's a, there's a function, geom histogram, that will produce a histogram and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that, that summarizes um, kind of basic, there's summary statistics going on in the background there, okay? And, um, and, and you'll have to do that, okay? There's other functions, okay? Again, if, if you check the reference, there's, you know, the stat xx functions. There's just a, like a bunch of like, I want to create, a, plot the means or some regression line or something, this and that and this and that. There's, a, there's different options here, okay? All right, so uh, with the rest of today's lecture, I'll, I'll just show you at least um, just some three basic ge geometries. The, the bars, the lines, and the, the points which we use for scatter plots, okay? Because I'd say these are probably going to be your most common geometric objects, okay? And again, in ggplot, there is a lot, there are a lot of, uh, There's a lot of different geometries that you can do, okay? You can create box plots, contour lines, density plots, um, uh, uh, different kinds of things, polygons, quantiles, ribbons, smooth, spokes, I don't know, whatever. Different, different kinds of things. Probably, again, the most common ones that, uh, that we'll encounter will be the bars, the lines, and the scatter plots or the points. And, uh, and so I'll cover these, these here. Okay, so uh, so this is what we got: the point, the line, the bar, and then again the histogram and the box plot are also useful. There is a cheat sheet, um, which is pretty good. Okay, and um, and the examples that I'm using uh, use some data sets coming from the graphics cookbook, uh, and that's that's loaded by uh, you loading this library, okay? And ggplot is part of the tidyverse, so that, that gets included here. Okay, so let's talk bar graphs. All right, so here, here you, sometimes you just want, you've got the, the name, so we've got the control, we have treatment one, treatment two, right? You got some experiment where you got two different treatments you're testing out, you got the control, and these are just the values. And sometimes you just have the thing and the number you want to plot, okay? You, you don't need to calculate any kind of summary. You don't need to like tally up how many times did this appear or something like that. And so in that case, you can just do geom bar and say the thing that I want you to plot is just the identity, just the, the number, the value that's appearing here. So we just want the control to be plotted at 5.032, treatment one to be plotted at 4.661, treatment two to be plotted at 5.526. And there you go, okay? Control ends up, uh, we put group on the x-axis. So we got control, treatment one, treatment two. We got y uh, being the weight or the number that's being plotted, okay? Stat equals identity. All right, I think that's pretty, pretty straightforward. 
Okay. Here's another one, kind of like that. Okay. This time we want date. Okay. As far as dates go, how many dates do we have? Okay. So what this is is apparently we're growing cabbages. Okay. And apparently there's different cultivars of cabbage, right? Again, I'm not in agriculture, but you know. You, you talk about like apples and you got these different types of apples and apparently different t cultivars of cabbage and we want to see okay well how big how big did some of these things grow right so cultivar 39 you know we looked at its weight after 16 days after 20 days after 21 days okay and uh, cultivar 52 we looked at its uh, weight after 16 days 20 days 21 days the weights are going down I'm not quite sure how this this value is being recorded. So you'd think it grows as time goes on, but I don't know what's going on. So what am I doing? I'm gonna put date on the X. So how many positions am I gonna have going across the X? I'm gonna have three, D16, D20, D21 across the bottom, okay? Uh, we've got weight on the Y, so we're gonna be plotting this column weight uh, that's going to determine how tall my bars are, okay? Fill, fill is like, what color do I fill in the bar with, okay? The fill is going to be based on the cultivar, so we're going to have two colors of the fill, okay? We're going to do something called position dodge. So normally it stacks them on top of each other, but what we're going to do is we're going to dodge them so they end up, the bars end up being next to each other, okay? Stat equals identity means just plot these numbers, don't do anything with them, all right? And this is what we end up getting, okay? So dodging them puts, we've got the three dates, D16, D20, D21 across the bottom. We're going to dodge the two um, bars so they end up side by side rather than stacked on top of each other. Okay. If I got rid of, oh, I guess I, I didn't do it. But if I got rid of position equals dodge, they will end up stacked on top of each other. All right, so here is uh, another data set. This comes from the Diamonds data set. The Diamonds data set has something like 53,940 rows. It's a very, very, very big data set, okay? And um, I don't know if you've ever purchased some diamond jewelry, but diamonds are rated based on their carat, their cut, their color, clarity, and something else. There's, or maybe that's it. I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway, um, you've got all of these things. You know, carrots, how big it is, and, you know, cut is how good did the person do as, when they cut the diamond and stuff. And, um, and you want, you know, high clarity or things like that. Okay. So what we can do is we can go through, again, there's 53,940. We can say, you know, let's, let's do a bar chart where it's going to go through and it's going to count. Okay. So here... If you just do geo and bar, and here we just say X is cut, okay, then the default settings is that, you know, it's going to put the cut across the bottom, all right, and ggplot goes through and it counts up the 53,000 entries and says this many were ideal and this many were premium and this were very good and good and fair, okay. And cut, you can see the type of variable, it says ordered, ordinal, okay, which means it's a, it's a categorical variable, but it's ordered, okay, and, and so it doesn't go in alphabetical order, but it goes from worst to best, fair, good, very good, premium, ideal. That's not in alphabetical order, but it goes in order from least best to best type of cut, okay, and generally the cuts are be, being made by these expert diamond cutters. So most of the time they get premium and ideal cuts, but you know, sometimes they mess up and they only get a fair cut or something like that, okay? Okay, so um, here we're gonna take a look at another, very, uh, another data set. And this I think was from the 2000 or 2010 census, I don't know, okay? We just had the results of the 2020 census, and you know we had all of these population changes recorded. And California is going to lose a house seat, and you know other states are going to pick up some and things like that. But anyway, this is from an older census, and we just said, okay, 
which states grew the most and things like that, okay? And this is kind of, we're looking at the change and we just want to look at um, only the top 10. So when you rank the change, the ones that grew the least will be ranked one, right? Because they have the lowest numbers. The ones that grew the most will be ranked 50. Just default ordering or ranking, put smallest first and biggest last, okay? So we're gonna just say we want the ranks greater than 40. So that'll be 41 through 50. These are our top 10 um, highest changes, okay? And, uh, and this is what we have. We got Arizona and Colorado, Florida, things like that, okay? We also have states and their region and their change. And so here, we're gonna say, take the abbreviation, put it across the x-axis. So this just gets put in alphabetical order. It's not an ordered variable. There's no, um, it just puts it in alphabetical order, okay? We're gonna say, well, what is the value? Okay, that value is gonna go on the y-axis. The, um, the fill will be based on the region, so we have either the west or the south represented, and uh, the bar here is this, okay? So that's one thing, okay? Now, we could take that fill and map a numeric variable to it, okay? So here, we could say, put the change, okay? And then ggplot figures out, okay, the smallest change that we saw here was something around 15. The biggest change we saw is 35. So the smallest one get, will be this dark color, uh, the biggest number will be the bright color. Okay? What you can also do is you can reorder. You could reorder the things based on a numeric value. So here we're going to say aesthetic mapping, take the X and reorder it. Okay, what we want is we want the abbreviations, but we want it reordered based on the change. Okay, and so now we can see it goes from least to greatest over here, and now kind of the jump between greatest to the second greatest, that, that's made all the more stark. Yeah, question? The fill, is for the, color. the fill is for the color, yeah. If you have color on a bar chart, it's like the line outline. It's like a, you have a rectangle, you can color, you can choose the color for like the outline of the rectangle, and then the fill is the color that goes inside the rectangle. Okay, so here you could say I want to pick um, my own colors, all right? These are supposed to be UCLA's colors, but the uh, projector messed it up, all right? So anyway, you can kind of uh, put in, you know, some kind of code here, an RGB code, or uh, there, I think you can also put like Pandoc codes and things like that. Um, so you can choose the scale, scale fill manual, and again, this is for the west and the south, uh, where we're doing fill based on region, okay? You can also do the same thing where you have the numeric variable where it's going to pick, uh, fill out a gradient here, okay? So here we said uh, for the scale, we want the fill gradient. And again, you can always look up the help here. We can say I want the, on the low end, I want red. On the high end, I want blue, okay? Oh, geez, I got to speed up. Okay, uh, second view quiz answer is the letter D, D as in dog. D as in dog is your second view quiz answer. Okay. All right, I, I, I'm going to speed through the line graphs, okay, just because I want to get to spend a little bit more time on the scatter plots, okay? So here I've got values, two columns of numeric values. We just do geom line, okay, and then it connects them, okay, it connects these things. So the order in which they appear is going to be the order in which they get plotted, okay? So if, they, if you have them all kind of scrambled up and you do a line, it's going to get all funny looking, okay? Um, here I've got two groups. I got orange juice and vitamin C. This is we were looking at how much the guinea pig, pig teeth grow if they were given orange juice or vitamin C because apparently that's connected somehow. All right, we gave them orange juice or vitamin C supplements, and you can um, here we said okay, put the dose on the x, the length on the y, and the su supplement what kind was it orange juice or vitamin C will determine the color of the line, okay? So you have that, right? And if you're dealing with um, a black and white plot and you don't have the option of having colors, you can also do line type and you can have solid lines and dotted lines and dashed lines and I don't know, I guess different kinds of lines. But you know, lines, 
dotted and dashed lines are like very, very difficult to see. They're hard on the eyes. So uh, you can also add a setting that makes your line width thicker so it's a little bit easier to see and notice. Those are choices. Okay, let's talk about the scatter plots. Scatter plots. Here I've got some data where we're looking at people's uh, age and their height. We put X on the age, Y on the height, and we can, you know, these are people, these are basically teenagers, and we're asking, like, how, you know, how, how much do these people grow, right? We got 12, 14, 16, uh, you know, looks like 17, 18 year olds and stuff, and apparently, you know, we didn't just ask how old are you, but we asked, like, what month were you born in? And that way you can, we can say you're like 12 years old and 12.1 and 12.2 or 12 point something. So, so you have kind of, the dots are all kind of spread out here, right? Okay. Um, we could change the shape of the point. So the default is just a solid dot, okay? There is kind of a, you can say, you know, I don't like solid dots. I want little circles, okay? And you can choose, um, a different shape. There, there's shape codes, and you can ask, you know, are uh, plot character, I don't know, character, plot character symbols, okay, well, yeah, so this is kind of like a listing of some of the different plot characters that you can use, and I think, I don't know, there's probably other things, other other codes, and you can just kind of do these things, right? You can also change the size of the dots. We've already seen that being done, okay? Here we're going to say, let's take the uh, the sex, male or female, that's what we have in our data set, and, uh, and let's color our dots based on sex, okay? So we have red dots for female, blue dots for male. Okay, and it's a little bit harder to see, but we can see, you know, okay, our tallest ones over here are female, are, are male, and the, over here. And we also see, you know, around 12 years old, there's a big mix. Uh, by the time you're 16, 17, there starts to be a distinction between, a separation between uh, the heights of uh, males and females. Okay. All right. Again, if you don't have the ability to change colors because you're printing something out in a black and white printer, you could change the shape, okay? Now this is hard on the eyes. We got triangles and we got circles. And you gotta like look really carefully. Um, you know, this is, it's much easier to see a pattern here than it is over here, I think. Um, so we've got that, okay? You could add smoothing lines, okay? Smoothing lines, and this would be a linear regression fit, okay? The LM means a linear model. So here we say, add a smoothing line method LM, okay? And that will say, all right, this is the straight line for males, this is the straight line for females. And so it, it takes all of these attributes, right? And it says, okay, we split um, the color based on sex, so it's gonna create two of these plots here. Um, here, SE, this is kind of your standard error. This is like error bars, right? Um, and we haven't really talked about this. But this line that we're fitting, this is just an estimate. This is an estimate based on the data we have. And we re ac acknowledge that there's, you know, just some uncertainty. And so we say, you know, if we had a different data set, maybe our line would look a little bit different. So we can also add a little error bars, bars of to kind of represent how much uncertainty there is. Okay. Is that okay so far? Okay, with all of this? All right, there's another thing that we can produce called a facet grid. So here you might, I think this is fine, having different colors, but in some cases, like for example, what if you had like four categories or five categories? It might be difficult to see kind of all four or five different plots um, you know, with all of these different colors and stuff, it might be a little bit difficult to see. So one thing you might want to do is you might do something called a facet wrap, okay? And what this will do is, rather than plotting here the males and the females on the same plot with different colors, you can separate them out. And you can put the males on one side and the females on the other side, okay? And so this takes that categorical variable and it creates one plot using only the female dots and another plot using only the male dots. And again, depending on the data set, 
a facet wrap might be a more uh, a more clear way to plot the data. Not always the case, but sometimes it is. Okay, and uh, and I think in your homework or you know as you explore some of these things, you might see examples of, of facet wraps being being plotted. I think actually, if we go to uh, LA Times coronavirus tracker. Here's an example of, this is basically a facet wrap, okay? Here is, it's looking at kind of the, the latest county, uh, the cases in each of the different counties within California, okay? And rather than, because in California, I don't know how many counties we got, we got a lot of counties, okay? Rather than having like all of these lines plotted on top of each other, where that information would get really hard to d distinguish, they separated them out, right? So these are kind of uh, all of the different things. And we can see all of these different things. And, and so sometimes when you have so many, it's also difficult, but it, you know, with, we, we just have so many different um, counties that um, this, is, this, is, this would be a facet wrap, okay? Where we split out the, uh, the display into a bunch of different facets here, okay? Um, Whereas over here, you know, because there's only two, it, they, they plotted. We have intensive care versus other. Both of those things are plotted on the same, same graph, okay? So depending on what you're trying to communicate, maybe you want two uh, facet wrap or maybe you want them on the same plot, okay? And again, you can kind of combine a lot of these different elements, and that's kind of the beauty of ggplot is you can say, well, I want the facet wrap plus the linear model lines being plotted, or things like that, right? And so you can kind of just add the different elements um, together, okay? Uh, so look at, read through the textbook, there's some good examples there. This one, if I said uh, method LM, if I take that off, the default, the default smoother is the lowest curve, okay, which we haven't talked about. This is a, a non-parametric fit. And basically, you're basically giving somebody that just says, hey, try to draw some kind of uh, line, and as long as it's kind of smooth, have it go through the data. And there, there is a process for calculating the lowest curve. Uh, we're not going to cover it here, but basically, it's, it doesn't have to be a straight line, right? LM says, I want a straight line. And Lois says, you know, I just want something smooth here. Okay. And so there's different options, and uh, you know, a lot of kind of exploration, a lot of kind of trial and error, a lot of guess and check, and and uh, as far as you know, does this visualization communicate what it is that I'm trying to communicate? Right. Okay. Let me give you your last view quiz answer for today. Today's last view quiz answer is E. E as an elephant. E as an elephant is your last view quiz answer. Okay, um, that's it for today. Uh, have a good weekend, you guys. We'll see you guys on Monday. And, uh, and please take a look at your homework assignment and you know, get started on that, and, and hopefully things work out. All right, you, you run into problems, come to office hours. All right, we'll see you guys.